I may have told you this story before, and if I have, I apologize. I don't like repeating myself, but it's one of those stories that I'm probably going to carry with me till the day that I die. We have some good friends of ours who moved out of the area, but we still like to get together and spend time with them. So once or twice a year, we try to get our families together. Either they come out to Pennsylvania or we go out to Ohio. Our tradition for the past several years has been between Christmas and New Year's, we go out to Ohio and spend a couple days with them over the holidays. So a few years ago, we were out spending time with these friends, and my friend suggested, hey, do you want to go play racquetball together? I'd never played racquetball before in my life, and I'm not, uh, how should we put this delicately, I'm not naturally gifted in athletics, but I was like, sure, I'll go play racquetball. It sounds like an experience. We'll give it a shot. And so we go, and it's just the two of us on this racquetball court until his friend shows up to join us in playing racquetball, a guy I'd never met before. And so the three of us played racquetball for a little while, and if you've ever played racquetball before, particularly if you've ever played racquetball for the first time before, you know how embarrassing this was for me. It was just awful. I could not return anything. It was embarrassing. And so finally we wrap up our games. I tried to be a good sport about it, even though it wasn't very enjoyable for me. We wrap up our games and we go to the locker rooms. And if you're someone who, like me, is not naturally gifted at athletics, maybe you, like me, kind of hate locker rooms. They're horrible, horrible places. I would much rather just go home, even if I'm all sweaty and disgusting, just go home and get changed and showered in the comfort and privacy of my own home. But that wasn't an option. We were there in this locker room. So I had just gotten humiliated in racquetball. I'm sitting in a locker room where I'm not very comfortable. And then this friend of my friend, who I did not know, wants to make small talk. I love small talk. <laughs> and he starts with the standard question, so what do you do for a living? And I told him, I'm a pastor. And he said, oh, what, uh, what church are you part of? And I said, I'm a Mennonite. And his third question is, so what's your take on gay marriage? And I thought in my mind, my dude, I do not know you at all. I'm on vacation. People pay me to have this conversation. That's the only reason I ever have that conversation. I do not want to talk to you about this in this smelly locker room after just being humiliated in racquetball. I don't want to have the conversation. And honestly, I don't remember what I actually said to him. I know I didn't say the things that I wanted to say to him. I don't remember exactly what I said to him. But I know what I say now when I'm asked that question. And I get asked that question pretty regularly. And just about every time I get asked that question, my response includes some variation of the phrase, it's complicated. And I know that saying that, that saying it's complicated, probably makes me lose some of you. Because for some of you, it is not complicated at all. For some of you, it is a clear-cut question of justice. God is love, and love is love, and so who are we to stand in the way of people expressing their love to one another? It's not complicated, it's clear-cut. And for others of you, it's not complicated because you believe the scriptures are clear. The Old Testament, the New Testament, Jesus himself affirmed that marriage is between one man and one woman. This is how God created it and ordained it at the beginning. It's not complicated, it's clear-cut because scripture is clear. And both of those viewpoints, and probably many others, are present within this congregation, within this room this morning. People who have easy answers to the question but would disagree with one another, people who see some complexity in it but might disagree with others, there are lots and lots of ways that we might disagree about the answer to this question. And so what should we do about our disagreements? Are we consigned to a fate of just perpetually arguing with one another? Should we marshal our arguments, come up with our best rationale and reasons, find our team, those who agree with us, take a side, take a stand, draw a line in the sand? Is that what we should do? Figure out what we know is right and fight for it against those who would disagree with us. Stand where we stand and draw the line in the sand. Those who are right are on my side of the line. Those who are on the other side of the line are wrong. Draw a line in the sand. This phrase is intriguing to me, draw a line in the sand. As best we know, this phrase actually comes from the story that Jim read for us from the Gospel of John, where Jesus has this encounter. 
There's a woman who's caught in the very act of adultery, and she's brought to Jesus by the scribes and Pharisees in order to trap Jesus, to test Jesus. Sort of like probably how I felt in that locker room. There's a right answer to this question, but I don't know what his right answer is, so I really can't answer it the way he wants me to. And so they come to Jesus, they bring this woman to him, and Jesus bends down and writes with his finger on the ground. And it seems that this is where the phrase, draw a line in the sand, comes from, even though it's not actually what the text says. People recognize that where Jesus was, this area in Israel, Palestine, was dusty, sandy all the time. It's presumed that the ground is sand, and Jesus draws something in it. And people assume that what Jesus does is draw a line. Draw a line to divide us from them. Those who are right about this question from those who are wrong about this question. We can sort of presume that it's Jesus and the woman on this side of the line, and it's those accusing her on the other side of the line. Right and wrong, a line in the sand separating them. But what if Jesus didn't draw a line? Because the text is ambiguous. We don't know exactly what Jesus was drawing. It seems that he draws twice in this text, and we don't know. The author of the Gospel of John does not give us that insight. Jesus bent down in the sand and drew this. And the Greek verb, the the drawing or the writing, can mean both of those. It can mean that Jesus is drawing something, or it can mean that Jesus is writing something. So there have been different schools of thought around how we ought to interpret this text. What is Jesus actually doing here? And one school of thought says that Jesus is doodling. That Jesus is just not interested in this trivial matter. Jesus refuses to get involved in solving this dispute, and so he entertains himself by bending down and doodling. I don't know if that's a persuasive interpretation or not. I think it's kind of fun, though. Another school of thought, another interpretation said it doesn't really matter what Jesus was drawing. What matters is that Jesus is drawing with his finger in the dirt. Because this is a question about the law of Moses. And the tradition surrounding the law of Moses is that God himself inscribed the stone tablets with God's finger. And so Jesus' act of drawing in the sand with his finger when confronted with an interpretive question about the law of Moses, this is Jesus asserting his own authority to interpret this question. Jesus is saying, just as God drew in, the, in these uh, stone tablets, I am drawing in the sand. Make the connection, understand who I am. Another school of thought of interpretation around this text is that what Jesus actually started to do in the sand was to write down other ways that the law of Moses had been transgressed. Other acts of sin. Other things that had been done, not just this woman with her act of adultery, but other sins that had been committed, other ways people had fallen short of the law of Moses. And what some scholars speculate is that Jesus was drawing sins that those in the crowd had personally committed. That Jesus was drawing from his prophetic insight and knowledge into their behavior. And that one's really intriguing to me. Because that shifts the scene completely. Because now it's no longer a matter of Jesus drawing a line to separate us from them, but it's Jesus drawing a circle that encompasses both us and them, that all of us are in this circle, this common space of sinfulness together. That what Jesus is asserting is not that the woman is right and her accusers are wrong, but what Jesus is asserting is that the woman and her accusers stand together in a common need of grace and forgiveness. Maybe... This story of Jesus encountering this woman is not about how to separate us from them, but how to recognize the commonality that we and they hold together. And so I wonder, when we think about our debates and disagreements about the LGBTQ community, about the question of gay marriage, about the question of sexual ethics, are there things that we hold together? Even as we have disagreements, even as we have differing interpretations, are there commonalities? Are there things that we actually already agree on but might not realize it? Are there ways that we are not divided by a line but held together in a circle? 
So what I want to test with you this morning are 10 agreements, 10 things that I believe we do, in fact, already agree about. Now, 10 is way more, you're like, John, you usually only give us three things. Why are you giving us 10? We're going to move through them quickly. Don't worry. I'm not going to hold you here all day. And I'm not saying that we have to agree on these. I'm not saying this is a requirement, a litmus test to be a good Christian or to be a member of the Mennonite church or anything like that. What I'm saying is we might be surprised to discover that we do, in fact, agree on these 10 things. And actually, you have an insert in your bulletin. If you grabbed a bulletin this morning... Uh, there's a chance that you can follow along and jot some notes down to take these home and sort of ponder them and think about them. Maybe you can rate your own agreement. Yes, I do agree fully with this statement. Yes, I agree with reservation. No, I don't think I agree. I definitely do not agree. Think about your own agreement or lack thereof with these statements. And if you want to divide them up, the first three are sort of about theology and anthropology, how we think about God and humanity. The next three are about ethics and the, the rest are about our community, how we live together. I believe there are some extras that the ushers have, and maybe if you need a writing utensil, you'll have to borrow from a friend. Let's do that. So you ready? We're going to test these 10 statements to see whether or not we might actually agree on these, even while acknowledging their ways that we disagree. The first statement is this. All people are created in the likeness and image of God. This is foundational Christian theology 101, the opening words of the Bible. God creates the world, and then within that world, God places humanity and says, let us make humanity after our own image and our own likeness. Sometimes modern theology begins at a different point. It has a different starting point for its narrative that uses language maybe of original sin or total depravity. That says the most important thing you need to know about humans is that we are fundamentally broken. But that's not actually where scripture begins. Scripture does not begin the story of God and humanity in Genesis 3 with the fall and human rebellion and human sinfulness. Scripture begins in Genesis 1 with an assertion that all people are made in the likeness and image of God. And then if you fast forward to the arrival of Jesus, and then a little bit after that, as people begin reflecting on what it means for Jesus, God, to have come in the flesh, what you start to see is that people have this light bulb moment of realizing, oh, Genesis 3, the fall, rebellion, human brokenness, cannot undo Genesis 1. Even if humans sin, even as humans sin, God persists in seeking to restore us to right relationship, to affirm the goodness that God created us in. You see this most clearly in uh, St. Athanasius's uh, On the Incarnation, as he reflects on the human condition and the arrival of Jesus and says, this is what God, the lengths God was willing to go to, to reaffirm and restore the image-bearing capacity of human beings. All people are created in the likeness and image of God. I think we might all agree on that one. Next, God desires all people to live with dignity and in safety. This is both a New Testament and Old Testament concept. In the New Testament, we see it in Jesus, where Jesus says that God causes God's sun to shine and God's rain to fall, or God provides the basic building blocks of human life on the just and the unjust, the righteous and the unrighteous alike. God desires for all people to live with dignity and in safety. In the Old Testament, we see it in Habakkuk, this vision that everyone shall live under their own vine and fig tree and no one shall make them afraid. This is what God desires for humanity, that all people regardless of their moral standing, whether they are just or unjust, righteous or unrighteous, that God desires for all people to live with dignity and in safety. And what grows out of that is this assertion. Hatred and ridicule have no place in Christian life. Hatred and ridicule have no place in Christian life. If all human beings have been made in the likeness and image of God and God desires all people to live with dignity and in safety, then hatred and ridicule have no place for those of us who are claiming to follow Jesus. 
Frank Schaefer, the son of the influential theologian, evangelical theologian Francis Schaefer, describes a meeting that he sat in between his dad, Francis Schaefer, and Jerry Falwell Sr. And they were talking about the LGBTQ community, although they didn't use that acronym yet. And what Jerry Falwell Sr. said was, if I had a dog who did what those people did, I would take it out back and shoot it. And I want to be as clear as I can, there is nothing Christian about that statement. Whatever your thoughts about sexual ethics, that statement is antichrist. That statement is a negation of God's good creation in all humanity. There is no space for hatred and ridicule within the Christian life. I think this is something we might agree on, even if the church has not always lived up to this ideal. And much of the church's witness in the world around these questions has been saturated with hatred and ridicule. But that's a sub-Christian response or an un-Christian response. There's no space for hatred or ridicule in Christian life. And so with those sort of theological and anthropological, our understanding of God and understanding of humanity, with those commitments in place, maybe we can talk a little bit about ethics because this is where the rubber hits the road and it seems that we often have our most, our, our most strenuous disagreements. But even in the midst of those disagreements, there might be some things that we hold in common. First is this claim that sexual ethics are a matter of discipleship, or in other words, God cares what we do with our bodies. There have been attempts made at various points in Christian history to separate the body from the spirit and to say that all God really cares about is the spiritual. One of the earliest of them emerges fairly early on in the Christian tradition. It gets called Gnosticism for its focus on knowledge, the Greek word for knowledge, gnosis. It gets called Gnosticism, and part of what grows out of that is this idea that God doesn't really care about the body. God doesn't care about the material world at all, and what God desires is that we would transcend the material world. And what this leads to is two things. One is a profound sort of liberty or license that people say it doesn't matter what I do with my body. And the other, it's sort of mirror image or inverse is people saying, well, everything I do with my body is wrong. But neither of those are Christian ideas. God creates us in the beginning. God creates us as embodied beings. God creates us to have bodies and God cares about our bodies. And so what that means is that our sexual ethics are not disconnected or divorced from our faith, but are a part of discipleship. I think we might agree on that. Another thing that we might agree with, although it would take an awful lot of careful definitional work, and I don't want to gloss over that, but I think almost all of us would agree that sex outside of healthy boundaries causes harm. Now again, we would probably debate what exactly those healthy boundaries are or ought to be. But I think there's nearly universal consensus, and not just within the church, that there need to be some form of boundaries or parameters placed around our sexual expressions, or else we can harm ourselves and harm other people. We'll move fairly quickly to the next one, again, an area of agreement, I believe, that affirmative consent is an essential boundary for healthy sexuality. And this is one of those interesting things that sort of emerges in the aftermath of the sexual revolution of the 1960s. And by and large, I think Christians look at the sexual revolution and say, that was maybe a mistake, like maybe we shouldn't have done that. But we did, that's where society moved. But I think one good thing that came out of that is a greater recognition, a greater emphasis on the concept of consent. Often the Christian church glosses over this question because it reserves sex for marriage and then misinterprets 1 Corinthians 7 that talks about the husband's wife belonging to his body and the wife's body belonging to her husband, misinterprets or misapplies that in order to justify coercion and even abuse. The church has lost the capacity to talk about the importance of consent within sexual ethics. And I think in some ways, the sexual revolution, as much as we might disagree with some things that came out of that, the emphasis on consent that has emerged is actually a way that God might be teaching God's church uh, through what is happening in the broader culture. I think we might agree that affirmative consent is an essential boundary for healthy sexuality. Now, with those Uh, questions of ethics sort of laid out, again, recognizing there could be an awful lot of disagreement. What do we mean by healthy boundaries? What do we mean by harm? There are a lot of things we would continue to disagree about. I think we might agree on those three ethical claims. Let's talk a little bit about our 
society or our culture, our sociology. I think we can agree together that rapid social change can be disorienting. And the implication of that is that it's okay to be confused. Now, if you're someone who primarily sees these questions in justice issues, you might not be pleased with the pace of social change. You might say the change has been too little and too late and too slow in coming. Justice delayed is justice denied. And I can understand that. But I also think it's possible to look at our shared experience of, say, the past 60 years and see just how rapidly things have changed. And not just that things have changed rapidly, but the pace of change has increased over time. If you think about the 40 years from, say, 1960 to 2000, you see some movement in there. You have the Stonewall riots, you have the AIDS crisis, you have a growing consciousness and growing awareness. There is change, but change is happening slowly. But then if you think about what's happened from 2000 to, say, the year 2020, half the span of time, but so much more change. A movement towards civil union laws, and then individual states legalizing gay marriage, and then a nationwide approach to legalizing gay marriage, and then an emergence of a conversation about gender and transgender questions. The pace of change is increasing. Whether we agree with the change or disagree with the change, just the pace itself can be disorienting. And so if you find yourself coming into this conversation and tripping over basic acronyms like LGBTQ, that one took a long time for me to master personally, it's okay. It is okay if you personally have had a hard time keeping up with the pace of change. The pace of change has been rapid and disorienting. And so if you find yourself confused or disoriented, that makes sense. You have lived through a seismic change in a relatively brief period of time. And we aren't always good at finding our bearings in the midst of this change. There's been rapid change. And what goes along with this rapid change is an affirmation that individual conscience should be respected. I think this is something that we can agree on. Although, again, I recognize this gets tricky because sometimes individual conscience is used as an excuse to deny basic rights to others. Uh, you think about the questions around cake bakers and florists at weddings and the contentious litigation that has happened has gone to the Supreme Court. It gets tricky. It's not, none of us are purely isolated individuals. Even so, I think as followers of Jesus, we have the capacity or should cultivate the capacity to respect one another's individual consciences. I think this is particularly true in the Anabaptist or Mennonite tradition that place such a strong emphasis on the voluntary nature of faith, that the decision to follow Jesus is a decision we enter into freely and without coercion or compulsion. It's not something we can be entered into before we can give our own enthusiastic yay and amen to the decision to follow Jesus. The Anabaptist movement is built on a, a deep respect for individual conscience. So what that means is that if society is changing and there are individuals within that society who are uncomfortable with that change, we should think about how do we respect one another's consciences. As we come to differing conclusions about these questions, we can still respect one another. But as followers of Jesus, the individual conscience is not supreme. It's to be respected, but the normative basis of Christian life is scripture. And there's a lot packed into this statement that we're not gonna have time to fully unpack, but I would say that scripture, as interpreted by Jesus' church, is normative for faith and life. Normative just means it can set the baseline, it can set the norms, it can tell us what an ideal life ought to look like. Scripture, as interpreted by Jesus' church, is normative for faith and life. And so as we think about our own response to these questions, our own responses should be shaped and informed by Scripture. And so if we're advocating for change, we should make that, we should do that advocacy work rooted in a deep engagement with scripture. And if we're advocating to hold on to more traditional understandings, we should do that rooted in a careful, thoughtful, communal engagement with scripture. Scripture as interpreted by Jesus' church is normative for faith and life. 
And finally, one more claim about our shared life together, which is I believe that all of us value our relationships with one another. And it's part of what makes this conversation so difficult because we have different personal experiences, different families, different convictions, but we value our relationships with one another. And we've seen how this conversation has torn congregations and area conferences and the denomination and other denominations has torn them apart. People have drawn their lines in the sand, taken their stand, on this side is correct, on that side is incorrect, and if you are on the wrong side of the line, we cannot be in relationship anymore. But all of us value our relationships together. I've had people talk with me in the lead up to this sermon series and gently or maybe sometimes not so gently say, do we really have to do this? <laughs> do we really have to have this conversation? Isn't it easier to just not talk about it? And I agree, in some ways it probably is easier to just not talk about it. It allows for a thin veneer of civility to cover some deep disagreements. And civility is not a bad thing. I am pro-civility. <laughs> But I'm also pro-honesty and honest engagement with one another and even honest engagement in the midst of differences. Because if we truly value our relationships with one another, then we should have the capacity or cultivate the capacity to talk honestly with each other, even knowing that we might disagree. And so I ask myself, if we agree around these 10 things, is that enough? Is that enough to form a basis of common life? That we have some shared convictions around the nature of God and the nature of humanity, some shared convictions around the importance of sexual ethics even as we disagree about the interpretation, and some shared convictions about how we ought to structure our life together so as to interpret scripture together and respect, respect one another's individual consciences. Is this enough? If we agree with these, and I'm not, again, I'm not saying that you have to, but if we agree with these, can we stand in the circle together, holding these agreements while allowing for differences of opinion and differences of interpretation and even differences of practice? Can we still affirm that we are in this circle together? Or do we need to default back to drawing lines in the sand, drawing narrower and narrower and narrower boxes around ourselves that separate us from one another? I honestly don't know if this is enough. I think about the future of the church, the future of the denomination, and I wonder, it seems like we're headed toward more disagreement, more fracturing, more splintering, more lines in the sand, harder lines in the sand, sharper edges in our conversation. That seems to be the trajectory that we're on. But I'm not sure that's what Jesus would will for us. Jesus came into this moment with this woman and her accusers, and he bent down and he wrote on the ground. I don't know what he was drawing. But then he says to these accusers, let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And once again, Jesus bent down and wrote on the ground. And when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the elders. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. And Jesus straightened up and said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, sir. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go your way, and from now on, do not sin again. And maybe if we come to Jesus with our own questions, our own complexity, our own transgressions, maybe we will hear Jesus say the same to us, that Jesus does not condemn us. He doesn't condemn us for the ways we've fallen short in our sexual ethics. Jesus may, might not even condemn us for the brokenness we've created within our relationships, but Jesus calls us to something more and greater, that freed from condemnation, we can move forward without sinning again. Would you pray with me? Gracious and merciful God, we give you thanks that you have created each and every one of us in your own likeness and image. 
and that you've created us to be in relationship with you and relationship with one another. And we confess that sometimes we don't know how to live rightly within those relationships. And so we pray, God, that you would give us your grace and your wisdom. And that we would seek to be faithful in our relationship with you and our relationship with one another, even when it gets complicated. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.